My first experience uh, uh, at a synchrotron was uh, to visit the super proton synchrotron at CERN uh, while I was in high school. And I was hosted by my uncle, who is quite an important physicist at CERN. He was the head of the vacuum section. The role model that was my uncle really pushed me to try this uh, this career, and, and so that, that it was that I uh, entered the University of Milan and I got a degree in physics. I visited CERN later on once more when I was deciding what kind of physicist I wanted to be. Um, and um, again, that experience um, made me decide that I probably didn't want to be an accelerator physicist and probably didn't want to be a particle physicist unless I could be a theorist, because that kind of very collaborative, large-scale physics really didn't suit my personality. I really like to work with a small group and seeing stories developing from the very beginning and being able to construct the whole narrative. After I did my national services in Italy, it was mandatory at that time, I got a position uh, with an Italian research institute to work on superconductivity. And that was very exciting at that time because uh, high temperature superconductors had just been discovered and awarded the Nobel Prize the year after. And I also was lucky enough to get uh, funding to visit Argonne National Laboratory for six months. And Chicago made an incredible impression on me. Uh, you know, the, the landscape, the contradictions, the visual starkness, the beauty of the architecture and the lake. So, I remember being really shocked by, by that, and I, I initially I thought I can never live here, but then I lived for five years in Chicago, and it was great. We were mainly work, working on high TC superconductors, and um, this was an incredibly exciting activity because we were discovering materials almost every day. So our work was at the very center of the worldwide community working on superconductors. My time in Chicago was really uh, when I decided that what I wanted to be uh, as a grown-up. The atmosphere of the group, the way uh, my, my mentor, Jim Jorgensen, uh, shaped the discussion in the group and the way ideas were developed really suited me. About 15 years ago, I was made the Dr. Lee's Professor of Experimental Philosophy at the Department of Physics, University of Oxford. Getting the position at Oxford it uh, was clearly a pivotal moment of my career and it was almost like being reborn professionally because I had to relearn to do a lot of things that I hadn't really done, like teaching for example, which is part of any academics um, activity. And it was a very, very strange and unusual title, uh, Dr. Lee's Professor of Experimental Philosophy, uh, to the point that I got a very nice letter from the Faculty of Philosophy say, uh, asking me if I wanted to join, which I politely declined. Uh, so it's really being a professor of physics. My predecessor, the most famous predecessor, um, was Friedrich Lindemann, who was the scientific advisor of uh, Winston Churchill. And obviously he wasn't doing much uh, science of his own uh, at that time, although he was extremely instrumental in building up British science and also bringing many famous people to, to Britain, like Albert Einstein or Schrodinger. Um, so I, I wanted to keep my small-scale, human-scale outlook on science, and I, I want, always wanted to have my small group on, with which I'm working on, on various scientific topics. Um, so I kept that, and I still have that, in spite of, of course, there are many disruptions, disruptions and destructions um, such as, for example, building a new building for the physics department, which I was very involved with, etc. So the area I work on is, uh, used to be called solid state physics. We tend to use condensed matter physics these days, and it, cons it is concerned with the physics that exist in, in materials, particularly, um, in my case, um, hard materials such as oxides or metals. The properties of these materials, the, the um, way these materials function, uh, it cannot be predicted easily from the properties of atoms. There are often very many extra ingredients, uh, and these extra ingredients collectively are known as emergent physics. So the physics emerges from the way you put these things together, and it's not predictable. The use could not be predicted so easily from, from that discovery.
Um, so you know, it is like this for many other things. Discoveries can, can be serendipitous. Nobody had predicted that ceramics could be superconductors. The question and the quest I'm on is, what is the next silicon? What is the materials that in 40 years time will shape technology, will shape the future of humanity, will enable us to work in a much more efficient, energy efficient, uh, and more intelligent way? Uh, what is that going to go in the brains of self-driving cars or self-driving planes in 40 years time? So this is my life's dream, if I can contribute to that. The odd thing about this field is that we have a whole library. You know, I often think about Borges' um, Library of Babel, you know, all these books uh, that need to be opened, but we don't know which one contains the secret recipe. So this is, we are exploring across the board on many physical principles, many materials, uh, with some of them we think we're promising. So within the largest uh, um, area of solid state or condensed metaphysics, uh, my work has tended to focus on uh, Transition metal oxides is just is a huge family of materials. It's a huge section of the library of the library I'm talking about, yeah. and and encompasses everything from the materials you use in your laptop for uh, the battery of your laptop, to sensors that you use in your car, to high temperature superconductors, and to many other things. Uh, and in particular, I've been focusing more most recently on the development of extremely tiny stable magnetic structures in transition metal oxides on one hand and uh, on the other hand the ability to control materials and eventually to control these tiny structures using light. So the one I'm currently betting on is, is the um, uh, vortex um, magnets, ma magnets containing structures, rotating structures and um, the reason why we think they are a, a promising candidate is that they are very small. Uh, they are contained in a material that is extremely cheap, extremely simple. They can be manipulated and they are stable. So they, they do not destroy, they do not annihilate. Imagine a set of compasses on a table. Yeah? And they will have north and south, each one of them. Okay? Normally, if you put them on the table, they will all point towards north. But they will also influence each other because they are magnetic objects. Right? So they may deviate from it, in some cases, from the north. Um, now, imagine you shrink this to the scale of hundreds of atoms. Okay? This structure on the table, all these compasses, you shrink and each atom is a compass. Now imagine that these compasses rotate and form a vortex, literally a hurricane made out of little atomic-like um, compasses. Okay, this is a magnetic vortex. Now, why is that interesting? Why can it give rise to technology? Th this is a static object, so there's nothing whirling around physically. There's no velocity, there's no wind. It's just all these arrows forming a pattern. Okay? What's interesting is the way these things can be excited. The excitations, Ima imagine you, you, they are excited like plucking a string, in this case by a, a pulse of microwaves and these start vibrating and oscillating. Okay? So the vortex will dance. Yeah? And this dance is what we think can be used to process the information. There is a promise that it could be used in a way similar to the way our brains use neurons. The human brain is an incredible machine, and if you compare it with, with uh, our current computing technology, has some amazing numbers. So uh, it, we can emulate the computing power of a human brain through some of our largest computers of a single human brain. Uh, a computer of that kind would be the size of two basketball courts, and, and we use about 10 megawatts of power. Uh, the brain does it in one and a half liters using 10 watts of power. So it is really a model, the way nature has shaped things to be extremely efficient, Think about the bird flying through, through, through a forest, you know, uh, the ultimate GPS, you know, it doesn't need uh, a lot of power, it doesn't need a lot of input, it doesn't have any external connection, it's not connected to the inter internet, yet it can process this information and never hits a, a, a tree. So this is what we want to be able to do, you know, very efficiently, very compact, very local, uh, low power, and this 
the silicon technology cannot give us that. We know the limit is already being reached decade, a decade ago. So this is why we need new platform, we need new materials, and this is where synchrotron really helps us. Another strand of my research, which sounds really strange, is to be able to manipulate magnetic materials, but also other materials using light in an extremely fast way. We have demonstrated we can create a magnetic uh, state uh, for uh, a few picoseconds, 10 to the minus 12 seconds, by shining light and exciting these materials. And then when the light disappears, the material is no longer magnetic. The two things actually are connected because if you want to construct uh, this artificial neuron, you want it to be fast. We know that we can be much faster than nature in that respect. And so we have to be able to process this information at these kinds of timescales. So the two strands of my research, although they are rather separate for now, they, my vision that they will come together eventually in something that is uh, both able to process information and to do is extremely fast in response to uh, radiation. Diamond is an extremely important tool to, um, for the kind of science I'm doing. Um, because the kind of x-rays that are produced by Diamond enable you to look at extremely detailed and fine properties of matter at the atomic scale, but to look at that in a device package. So you can build literally your own device of a few micrometer size, um, make it functioning, and then you can probe it and you can tell what the atoms are doing not individually, but you know, as a collective, using your X-ray. So this is the real power of, of of synchrotron, and this is what I've been doing for the last couple of decades using Diamond. All synchrotrons are great, but they're also different from each other. They are not all the same. They're not a copy of each other. Um, so Diamond is, uh, is optimized to be a soft X-ray, so-called soft X-rays machine, and they are ideally suited to study transition metal oxides. Transition metal oxides have resonances. They resonate uh, at the kind of characteristic energies of the soft X-rays. This is why you can use soft X-rays to do extremely powerful microscopes, uh, particularly useful to probe the um, structure of compounds or devices containing these kinds of metals, metal oxides. So my ambition is really to push these studies more and more towards um, the applications. Uh, that is, not only to study model systems in packages that are very small and are similar, compatible to what you would use in a device, but on actual devices, and build something that would work, build an artificial brain, or at least part of it. So this is what I would like to be able to do. Now, synchrotrons and x-rays, are extremely important for that. We will continue to use them. But if you really want to realize this kind of ambition, you have to have a whole package of infrastructures, the ability to build these things. And this requires extremely complex and sophisticated tools. Um, essentially, you want, you want to be able to grow. These materials are literally grown. Uh, they are grown as single crystals on substrates and, and, and then patterned at the, at the nanoscale. So if, if you want to be um, uh, surpassing silicon, we need to be able to work at the same kind of line scales. So this infrastructure is the one that will enable you know, the next silicon generation to, uh, to be realized. And this is what I will be able to like to, uh, be, uh, would like to be able to contribute to. I built and conceived new instruments, initially, uh, especially for neutrons, and, uh, uh, and later on, um, I also contributed to X-ray instruments, including instruments at Diamond. Uh, this started off because uh, whilst working in France, I got a position at the ILL reactor, uh, which is the most powerful research reactor in the world, and the position was that of an instrument scientist. So I had to uh, uh, operate and develop an instrument, and this gave me the real sense that from that position, uh, you can realize your scientific idea if you can keep pushing the, the instrument technology. Uh, perhaps the one I'm most proud of uh, is called WISH. Um, and it's, a, a, not by coincidence, a, 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 an instrument that is designed to study magnetic materials. 
Uh, it was a completely new concept. Nobody has thought about that concept before, at, at least not in that form. Uh, it's on a very um, a relatively weak source in terms of how many newtons per second you produce, that is the second target station. Um, but uh, in spite of this, is unsurpassed still to th this day and will remain such. And it's so oversubscribed, th th there are four days demanded for each day available, that ISIS wants to build a copy of it. So I'm really proud of that. When, when you build something almost with your own hand, uh, you can exploit it to its best. It's not just you know coming in and, and a routine uh, use of beam time, but you can really exploit all, all the facets of the instrument and, and make it work for, for, for you. Uh, you know, the beauty of, of, of these large-scale facilities is that it's not just my private instrument. It's a, an instrument, if I do something to it, or I, if I design a particularly successful instrument, everybody will ben benefit from it eventually. But I, I'll be the first. I'll be the first on the ground. I'll be the first to make the key discoveries, at least the ones in my area.